Good morning everyone and welcome to our morning service for this morning. I'm recording this on a rather dank and dismal day and uh, I need the house light on. And I guess that might reflect the mood of uh, many of us as uh, higher Covid restrictions loom all round about us. But we have a light that we don't need to switch on because he's always there. We have Father God who loves us and wants the very best for us. And so let's think about uh, our service this morning as we join together, as we continue to uh, uh, reflect on the words of St Paul to the Philippians. And this morning, the two words of the theme are confident anticipation. I guess we're many of us anticipating what's in future of us in the future for us, but perhaps some of us are not quite so confident. But we can have confidence in the God who loves us, who wants the very best for us. So let's hold those two words uh, uh, in in our thoughts and our minds. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you are a God who loves us and wants the very best for us. Would you move by your Holy Spirit amongst us as we uh, join together in this act of worship? Would you minister to us? Would you give us wisdom to understand the things that you want us to take into our hearts? That we can reflect on you and all that you've got for us. That we can look to you who are the same yesterday and tomorrow. That as we anticipate all that you've got planned for us, Lord. Let us be confident in it. Amen. And so as we move into our act of worship, our Bible readings today are read to us by Pauline MacDonald. Janet Royal will be talking to us and our prayers are led by Helen Kerr.
The first reading is taken from Philippians chapter 3, verses 4b to 14. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection, and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so, somehow, attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, Forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. The Gospel reading is taken from Matthew chapter 21 verses 33 to 45, the parable of the tenants. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvellous in our eyes. Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. Almighty God, I just lift up before you the words that I am about to speak and I pray for your anointing and may it reach the ears it's that are meant to be listening to it in Jesus's holy name I pray amen right morning everybody still living in strange times um but our God is there through everything and he never changes and we just thank you father God for that fact Right, so we're doing a session on Philippians and I'm doing this one this morning. So, <laughs> are we ready? So, um, looking at the reading from Philippians, I found myself thinking, what have I personally got to boast about? What in my life has been better 
greater than knowing that I am loved and wanted by Jesus Christ and what have I done in my life that would surpass what Jesus did for me he wanted and loved me so much that he died for me on that cross so he gives me the chance of a life filled with hope and overwhelming me with a never-ending love and finally when I die what will be said about me and will my death have changed any part of my world. These are asked and answered by Paul in his letter to the Philippians. So Paul was imprisoned, ill and struggling to provide for his basic needs. So why on earth did he hold fast to his trust and belief in Jesus when his life would have become easier and less stressful if he'd have gave in and denied his belief? Now for myself, I've always considered Paul as a bit of an optimist and according to Vera Nazarian, an optimist is neither naive nor blind to the facts nor in denial of grim reality. That's Paul. An optimist, according to her, believes in the optimal usage of all options available, no matter how limited. Again, that's Paul. And as such, the optimist always sees the big picture. And Paul definitely did. He saw it in a way that revealed to him by God and by his circumstances. So, and according to Vera, an optimist is simply a proactive realist. And that was Paul again. So Paul in this part of the letter is telling us that who we show to the world, our status, wealth, knowledge and skills are not important. What is important is who we say we are believers, followers and lovers of Jesus Christ. Paul is asking the Philippians and us to rethink what matters, what we say is important in our life. The world or Jesus. Now giving into the world is easy and it's been made very easy for us by the devil leading the charge. Oh look, like that. Here it is. See, that was easy. Here, there's more, there's lots more. We can be led very easily by our wants and our desires. None of us is faultless in these pursuits. But we can become greedy, selfish, spiteful and uncaring in our pursuit of worldly things. We become blinded by worldly things. More money, sex, gambling, drink, drugs, the newest bit of tech. Bigger is always better. The list is endless. Nothing makes the devil feel better than people getting greedy and selfish, coveting things or people. So, do we behave like children, wanting, desiring and craving what the world has on offer? Throwing tantrums, becoming rude and abusive if we don't get our own way? Or are we people who need, crave and yearn for the living Christ in our lives? Paul himself was a world pleaser before he met the living God in Jesus. And look how they have, the mighty have not only fallen, but have reveled in that falling. Some theologians state that Paul is our greatest teacher about the church and how it should be. He is the apostle of a faith that lays hold and does not let go upon the living Christ and relies on him alone. Is that who we are? Paul some theologians also say, was the champion of spiritual freedom, stating that there is no reason at all for fancy, drawn-out rituals, sacrifices and ceremonies to gain access to God. Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice before God. Put your life and trust into Jesus' hand and you are through into the courtyard of the King. Paul does admit, however, to being torn between his living life, his friends and those he has yet to meet, his desire to spread the gospel and his craving, his yearning to live a life, to be with Christ. But his eyes and spirit are fixed on Jesus even through those times. I often think that without the love and support of those other believers, their prayers and letters, Paul would have not so much as given up but have had a harder struggle to not give in to the world and to the pressure from those in authority. Do we not all share that worldly pressure to conform to what is expected of us? 
And do we not also rely upon the prayers and help of those who walk and follow the same path as us? The one that leads to Jesus and our hope for an eternal life in and with him. God was not and is not looking for, pe perfe for perfection sorry, in any of us. He already has that in his son Jesus. When God looks at us, he sees materials waiting to be melted, moulded, shaped and cured into what he needs us to be. Living and working with a purpose. His purpose in and for not only our lives, but his world. Paul himself didn't spend much time moaning about what he had lost in his love and trust of Jesus. He used his old life as a stepping stone to get closer to his beloved Jesus, stating his personal history as an example that anyone could have Jesus in their hearts and lives. Jesus doesn't care who we are, where we came from. He cares about who we say we are, his. All it takes is that first step of faith. I don't think any of us have had to make this type of sacrifice for our belief in Father, Son and Holy Spirit as Paul did and other Christians throughout the world have. Yet on our journey, we have followed, in a way, the steps that Paul himself took. But in our walking this path, are we constantly looking back, seeing if there is anything better, anything that we are missing now that we are walking with Jesus? What is there behind us that could make us change our direction, take those steps away from Jesus? In all of our lives, there have been times and times that have times and ties that make us leave the path. But I am so glad that his goodness is so great towards us that we are greeted on our return with joy and celebration. His goodness follows us everywhere, through everything. We might come last in the race towards Jesus, but he will wait at the finish line, no matter how long it takes us to get there. Paul's desire was that the gospel would reach the furthest corner of the world, and it did. It reached us. It changed us into a new people. When we believed in Jesus' death and resurrection, it changed us. And when we gave our hearts and lives to Jesus and welcome the Holy Spirit into our spirits. It allowed us to give us direct access to Father and his Son. Paul's true passion, desire and love was for Jesus. He gave up everything to gain everything. Hope for an eternal life with Jesus. Are we passionate about Jesus and his unending love for us? What would we be willing to give up for that love? Money? Our desires? our lives. As for the gospel reading, how many of us thank one another for their prayers, guidance, correction and support in our walk with Jesus? For myself, I know that I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for two Marys, one Clive and one Val. I wouldn't know what it feels like to be embraced in a love that brings true certainty that I have been and am loved every step I have taken either on or off that path. My path has been continually covered by the prayers of others. So now I ask you, are we like the nine lepers who only saw that they were healed and couldn't wait to get back into the world? Or do we remember who had done the healing? What have we got to boast about? What in our lives has been greater, better than knowing that we are loved and wanted by Jesus Christ? What have we done in our lives that would or could ever surpass what Jesus did for us? When we die, what will be said about us? Will our deaths have changed the world? Thank you.
wanted to use some of the words from Philippians to help us as we pray this morning. Paul writes, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. God, we want to praise you this morning that nothing compares to the knowledge of knowing you, that your worth and Jesus' death on the cross for us outweighs everything else in life. Lord, you are so great and good. You are perfect and loving, dependable and true. Thank you, God. Paul writes about the power of his resurrection. Lord, we pray that we may move and live in your power, that nothing would threaten or take away knowing Jesus, that we may have a confidence in how we love, in how we share the gospel, in how we live as witnesses to that power. Participation in his sufferings. Help us, Lord, to be ready to follow you, whatever the cost and wherever this leads us. We pray for our brothers and sisters in the worldwide church who know firsthand what it is to participate in your sufferings. We pray that you would bless them, keep them and sustain them, we pray. Paul writes, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. Father, please forgive us our sins. We know that you see deep into our hearts. Help us to walk away from sin and temptation and instead to strain and strive for your promises, that we would seek your face wholeheartedly. Lord, we lift up our local community. We pray your protection and safety over our church and our friends and family, especially those who are vulnerable and having to be extra careful at this time. We lift up our teachers and young people, that half term will be a well-needed break and a chance for refreshing. Lord, we pray for our nation and our leaders, for the difficult decisions that are having to be made. We pray for fairness and justice for people, regardless of where they live and what they do for a living. Lord, we pray for those who are lonely and missing contact and touch. We pray for those who are anxious or worn out. We pray that you would strengthen and sustain us almightily as we seek your face. And Paul writes, God has called me heavenwards in Christ Jesus. Lord, we pray that you would raise up your church, help us set our eyes afresh on you, that we may trust you in this great promise and that that would encourage us day by day in how we live. Lord, there is so much need and so many overwhelming situations. It can be hard to know how to pray. We just ask that you would accept these prayers for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.
That brings to a close our service for today. I hope that through the things that you've heard, through the things that you've seen, you will have been blessed and encouraged and strengthened. If there's anything in particular that has spoken to you through the service, or if there's anything that you would appreciate talking through with someone in confidence, then please do get in contact with us. Our contact details are at the end of this video, and we'd be more than happy to speak with you or pray with you. But for now, the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.